Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 tier list and guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today, by popular demand, we're covering shields. We'll be talking about their strengths and weaknesses, which characters each individual shield is good for, and whether they're worth picking up at all, or if you should just feed them to Gale. Shields are one of the most powerful and most important item slots in Baldur's Gate 3. Not only are they inherently extremely strong, the enchantments on them are excellent. On average, I think shields have the best quality of item effect of any item slot in the game. They're just... Uh, there's a very high bar for quality of shields, and because they're so widely available and so powerful, it's not unusual for a party to have three or even four characters running around with a shield on at once. Shields are just really good and improve the survivability of your party dramatically, so it's very important to know which ones to equip because the effects of them are so powerful and they're so easy to use. Shields are more widely available in Baldur's Gate 3 than they are in Tabletop, because in Tabletop D&D, um, shields are inherently extremely powerful. Letting you manipulate your armor class is something D&D is pretty cagey with because of the bounded accuracy system that says that you should be neither too difficult nor too easy to hit. Uh, but shields are one way to do that. They come with the trade-off, though, of only being available to certain characters and usually decreasing your damage output or overall power level when you have them equipped. But in Baldur's Gate 3, many more characters can use them because many races have inherent shield proficiency, so many characters, including most of the companion characters, just get shield proficiency for free, uh, and no matter what class they're using, will be able to use a shield. And secondly, shields have extremely powerful magical effects, so you're not really giving up anything in order to improve your party by having shields equipped. Furthermore, you can use shields in Baldur's Gate while you're using a ranged weapon. So archers, normally incapable of using shields, are one of the, the character archetypes that gets to use these most heavily in Baldur's Gate 3. So not only are they extremely powerful, the individual items are really good, the inherent effect is really good, they're also much more widely usable in Baldur's Gate, so you're going to be seeing them a lot. To rate the shields, I will be using the same tiers that I used for my armor tier lists. So in S tier, we will place items that are best in slot for a wide array of builds or specific very powerful builds. In A tier, items that are interesting alternatives to the S tier items or good for very specific uh, characters. In B tier, items that are usable by certain very narrow archetypes, so they might have a specific purpose with a certain kind of build. In C tier, items that are very narrow in scope, they're not totally useless, but most parties will not be able to use them. Maybe they're good for a specific unoptimized playstyle or something along those lines. And in D tier, items that will almost never see play and that you can pretty safely ignore. I will also be placing these in tiers based on their strength when you get access to this item, because it doesn't really make sense to rate an Act 3 item against an Act 1 item. You want to know whether it's worth using when you first get it. So we will be starting with the Act 1 shields, from the Broken Shield all the way through to the Woodwode Shield, then the Act 2 shields from plus 1 through the Watcher's Shield, and finally the Act 3 shields with the last remaining shields. That means that as we go through, the items to the right will tend to be stronger in absolute terms than the items to the left, not 100% of the time, but that will be the general average because they show up later in the game. Finally, before I begin, I do want to take a quick moment to say thank you so much to Master the Swag for the $5 donation, Malleus Maximus for the $100,000 don, Jim Neely for the $10, and Slaminjamin or Slaminjamin for the $15, as well as CB for becoming a channel member. Thank you so much, my friends. I really do appreciate the support. It really means a lot. All right, let's talk shields. We're going to start off with an easy one, the Broken Shield. The Broken Shield, or Training Shield, uh, shows up in a couple places in the game, basically as set dressing. Uh, the, it gives you one armor class instead of the two armor class that a normal shield gives you, which obviously is worse. And there's no Easter eggs or special interactions or anything for this item, so you can safely ignore it. D tier. Next up, the shield. So this is the basic non-magical shield. I've combined them all into one. It comes in a lot of forms, but they're all functionally identical, increasing your armor class by two. Increasing your armor class by two sounds like a relatively small effect, but it's actually a pretty significant bonus, and it can be helpful to think about what that means in actual play in order to understand why. 
whenever an enemy misses an attack against you, they're effectively stunned for that turn. A missed attack is basically the same as the enemy just doing nothing for their turn. And so a properly positioned character with high enough armor class is effectively casting Hypnotic Pattern on every enemy that attacks it, because uh, if you were casting Hypnotic Pattern, they'd have to roll a saving throw or do nothing with their turn. If you are positioning your tank where they're going to attack it, they have to roll high enough to hit the tank in order to have accomplished something on their turn. So having high armor class gives you significant action economy, advantages over your opponents because they it makes each action that they are taking less likely to do something in the actual combat. Secondly, in a lot of situations, your party's armor class is only as good as its weakest link. If your enemy can choose multiple characters to attack, the AI in Baldur's Gate prioritizes the easiest character to hit, alongside a bunch of other factors, but in general will target your lowest AC characters. So bringing up your characters with low AC to match your higher AC characters is going to improve the survivability of your party more than boosting the AC of your highest AC characters. Thirdly, every point of AC not only makes each subsequent point of AC better, uh, because as your armor class increases, you get to plan around enemies missing you more effectively, so it makes your turns much more predictable. It also improves the value of a bunch of other effects. Every hit point you have is better the higher the armor class you have, because you're just taking less incoming damage, so it takes more average attacks to reduce your hit points by the same amount, so the value of each individual hit point goes up. Similarly, every point of healing you have, every effect that gives you damage resistance, all of these increase in value the higher your armor class is. So while plus two AC on the non-magical shield may not sound like a significant bonus, it's actually a huge bonus and it snowballs across a whole bunch of other effects. And because the plus two uh, AC shows up at the earliest part of the game, the time when you both most need the help and are most likely to be attacked because your offensive combos probably are not yet online. The humble non-magical shield is one of the most important items in the entire game of Baldur's Gate. It's very worth designing your characters and builds so that your characters have shield access in the shield proficiency for the early game. I mentioned this in my armor tier list as well, but a character with 14 base dexterity Lazel's starting half plate and a shield has 19 armor class, which very few enemies in the first few levels of the game can actually hit. And it's pretty easy to get your whole party up to that armor class and become almost invincible for the early game. Therefore, although of course it has no particular magical effect and you're going to want to replace it as soon as you get access to other ones, the non-magical shield is still extremely important and is going straight into S tier. The Absolute's Warboard. So the Absolute's Warboard gives you the two armor class that all shields gives you, and if you have the brand of the Absolute, which you get through a story event, um, and all your party members can get this and everything, then it gives you plus one to your saving throws. That's a pretty powerful effect, especially for casters. Plus one to your saving throws could help you maintain concentration on spells. It also lets you cast the Heroism spell once per long rest, which isn't an amazing spell, but when you get it for free, it does have some uses. Mostly, this is just a shield that gives you plus one to your saving throws, but that's a pretty solid thing to be. And since it shows up sort of in the middle of Act 1, it's probably one of the first upgrades you get to a basic shield. So I'm going to put it in A tier, because it is a reasonably significant upgrade and of course it, you'll wear it because it's strictly better than the basic shield, but it's not going to uh, make or break your game, and if you choose to skip it for story reasons or just because uh, you didn't happen to get it uh, to pick it up or want to sell it in order to buy a more important item, it's not going to cripple your, your game, but it is just a very good item with a very solid passive benefit. The Adamantine Shield. The Adamantine Shield is the first shield that gives you access to Shield Bash, which is a reaction that a lot of these shields get. Basically, when an enemy hits you, you can spend your reaction to make them make a dexterity save or they fall prone. That's pretty powerful, because if an enemy falls prone on their turn, they lose the rest of their turn. So if their first attack hits you, you can cost them the entire rest of their turn with the shield bash reaction. 
Interestingly, this dexterity saving throw that they have to make uses your spell save DC, and it's actually your spell save DC, not your save DC for items and scrolls. So casters, uh, weirdly, are way better at applying the prone from shield bash than melee characters are typically. So this is going to be uh, especially good for like a druid or a cleric, uh, though obviously it's still a powerful effect for a melee character as well. In addition to that, the adamantine shield gives you when an enemy misses you, they get the reeling effect for two turns, which dis uh, decreases their attack rolls by one per turn remaining. So it's going to mean that if they miss you, they're going to keep on missing you. And finally, attackers cannot critically hit you. All of these features together are awesome. If an enemy misses you, they get worse at attacking in the future. So they're going to continue to lose damage uh, throughout the fight. If they hit you, you get a chance to knock them over and cost them the rest of their turn. And if if they were going to roll a critical hit, well, they can't. Being unable to be critical hit is incredibly powerful, both because it reduces the average damage that you're taking, but also it removes spikes and randomness from the game. Uh, I've said this many, many times, but uh, the enemy of optimization is randomness, so when you are the player, you want to reduce randomness as much as possible so that you can plan things in your favor. How you lose fights a lot of the time is by getting critically hit, and then the fight starts snowballing against you, because that character gets critically hit and drops, now they don't get an action, another character has to spend an action getting them back up, and so on. And so the fight starts turning against you, because now enemies are getting more actions than you are, uh, and it all snowballs off of a critical hit. That can't happen when you're immune to critical hits, so it gives you a ton of peace of mind throughout the entire game. The Adamantine Shield also just reduces enemy damage output dramatically, and because of Shield Bash does so uh, especially against enemies that are making multiple attacks per round, um, and remains the best-in-slot defensive shield throughout the entire game. For a pure tank or defensive character, the Adamantine Shield is actually the best defensive option in the game. A lot of the other shields have powerful effects, but even including the Act 3 shields, the Adamantine Shield, in my opinion, will reduce incoming damage more, um, except, of course, if you have critical hit immunity from another effect, then you could swap shields. But in general, the Adamantine Shield is just going to be incredibly powerful, very much worth spending one of your two Adamantine items on this item, and absolutely going straight into S tier. The Glowing Shield. So the Glowing Shield gives you the normal two armor class, and once per short rest, if you take damage while you're below 50% HP, uh, you gain eight temporary hit points. This damage doesn't have to be from an enemy. You can trigger it yourself, so you can have like your mage hand punch you for eight temporary hit points, and those those will last uh, until your next short rest. So if you want to go a little longer in a rest, you can use this as a slight HP buffer. But the glowing shield in general is a relatively minor effect. Now it's a minor effect that you get for free on top of just the normal effect of a shield, and it shows up early in the game, so for a lot of playthroughs this is going to be an, a strict upgrade over what you have available. But because this is a relatively minor effect that gets obsoleted pretty quickly, eight temporary hit points quickly stops being a super important amount, and you'll get temporary hit points from a lot of other sources, uh, the glowing shield will not stay relevant for very long. I'm going to put it in B tier, because it's still a decent effect for the early game, but uh, you will probably want to replace it with the other Act 1 shields, and then of course the Act 2 shields will obsolete these, a lot of these very quickly as well. The Safeguard Shield. So the Safeguard Shield is like the Absolute's Warboard, uh, in that it gives you plus one to your saving throws, as well as the normal two armor class, but doesn't require you to have the Absolute's brand in order to benefit from, from that, so it's available to any character no matter what story path you're taking. The Safeguard Shield is available very early, and for most playthroughs is going to be the first upgrade over the basic non-magical shield that you see. And so for that reason alone is going to be incredible. Um, and similar to the Absolute's Warboard, plus one to your saving throws is a very nice bonus uh, in the early game, especially for, especially for spellcasters who want to maintain concentration on spells. While obviously you're going to replace your non-magical shields with the safeguard shield, and it is very good, I'm going to put it similar to the Absolute Warboard in A tier, because it's it's a significant upgrade, but not one that you are desperate for, um, and it won't completely make or break your run if you swap from the shield to the safeguard shield, but you should, because it's free to do so. The Real Sparky Sparks Wall. 
So this is a weird one with a weird mechanic that doesn't really show up anywhere else in the game. It uh, gives you the normal 2 AC, but then for you can spend three lightning charges, which you can get from items. Some items will allow you to build lightning charges. The easiest one is probably the water sparkers, which give you lightning charges for just standing in water, um, in order to activate a lightning aura. This lightning aura, when you activate it, causes every enemy within 20 feet of you to make a DC 13 deck save, or they take 1d6 lightning damage. That by itself is not particularly exciting, that's just not very much damage, and the save DC is very low. But the lightning aura lasts for three turns, and during the three turns that it lasts, any enemy inside it cannot take reactions, they can't take reactions at all, um, and they take 1d4 lightning damage at the start of each of their turns with no saving throw. So this is effectively a saving throw for a very marginal amount of damage, but then an AoE no saving throw effect that uh, prevents enemy reactions and reduces uh, and does marginal damage to them. That's pretty powerful for a spellcaster because you can use this uh, to, like, as a disengage, basically you can cast it. It takes an action to activate, but you can cast it as an action and then disengage from an enemy. And preventing enemy reactions is pretty reasonable. No save damage is always, um, is always pretty interesting. Uh, and this one is, is cool just because it does passive damage around you. So you can use it to trigger all sorts of combos, damage riders and stuff. If you're doing just a like walking build, um, then this is going to be a key component of it where you don't actually use abilities, but just, or don't actually attack enemies, but just walk near them. They'll die. You can trigger cold a week, etc. So there's some abusive stuff you can do with this. But if you're actually trying to use this effect, that means you need to be a lightning charge build who typically want to use their lightning charges to attack with and do additional damage. Um, and uh, the effect is not particularly strong for most characters. So I'm going to say that this is a C tier item. It's interesting and gives you an additional option for lightning charge builds. And there are definitely some abusive combos that you can do with it. But for most characters, this is just not going to be effective. You have to use lightning charges, which are a very limited mechanic. Uh, in order to activate it at all. And if you do, it may not be worth the fuss, or your lightning charges are probably better spent just bursting down enemies rather than activating this aura. The Woodwode Shield. So the Woodwode Shield, which is a difficult phrase to say, is the last of our Act 1 shields, and it gives you the normal 2 armor class and the Wode's Ensnaring Strike ability. This is like Ensnaring Strike from Ranger that can uh, ensnare or entangle an enemy, but with a couple key differences. It's melee only, so you have to be within melee range of an enemy to use it, and it requires only a bonus action to activate. Uh, it doesn't take an attack or anything like that. And it doesn't take an attack roll. Enemies just have to make a saving throw against it. Enemies that you cast it on have to make a strength saving throw, which, just like the shield bash effect, is based on your spell save DC, not your item save DC, uh, and not your, um, like, maneuver DC. So spell casters are better at activating this than melee characters, so especially good for druids, clerics, characters like that that have shields, uh, shield proficiency. And it... If enemies fail the strength save, they take 1d4 bludgeoning damage, not in and of itself a big deal, but then they are also ensnared for three turns. Ensnared is a very powerful debuff. It makes enemies unable to move. They take 1d6 damage per turn. Attacks against them have advantage, and attacks uh, that they make have disadvantage. So it basically shuts one enemy down completely. Uh, this is amazing if you're hunting down enemy ranged characters, because they'll typically have low strength saves. You can get up on them as a bonus action, lock them in place, and just keep them locked down, give them disadvantage on everything and advantage on all your attacks. Since it's a bonus action, you can activate it and then attack with advantage if it succeeds. So it's very powerful for any character that wants to hunt down enemy spellcasters or ranged characters in particular. Not every party is going to have a character that can make use of it, but if you have a warlock or a swords bard or a paladin with a shield, so characters that have high save DCs and want to hunt down enemies in melee, then the Woodwode shield is going to be excellent. I'm going to put it in A tier because the effect is super strong. So a uh, party with any character that is has like a melee caster or just a character that wants or doesn't have a good use for their bonus actions normally, um, 
which a lot of melee characters at this point in the game won't, can make great use of the Woodwode Shield. It's available once per short rest, so it's very usable in a lot of combat, uh, and will just give you a nice bonus option as a bonus action. It's effectively free to use and powers up your party significantly with a, a very powerful debuff at your disposal. The plus one shield. This is identical to the normal non-magical shield, but gives you 3 AC instead of 2 AC. AC is still very good, of course, and more AC is even better, uh, so the plus one shield is excellent for that reason. These start showing up in Act 2 in a bunch of different forms. I believe there aren't any in Act 1, but if you've found one in Act 1, do let me know. Um, and upgrading from 2 to 3 AC on your shields is excellent. Often this will be better than the plus one to saving throws, though some characters may prefer that if they're trying to maintain concentration on spells. It's typically going to be quite a bit worse than the adamantine shield, so the plus one shield is going to be just a nice solid upgrade for any character that wants to defend itself, provided that uh, you aren't already using the adamantine shield on that character. I'm going to put it in B tier because it's it's a solid uh, shield, but you will quickly get ones with effects that are worth more than one armor class, and for a defensive option, I generally prefer the adamantine shield, so a lot of parties won't want to make the switch. The Absolute's Protector. So this has the same shield bash effect that the adamantine shield does, so if an enemy hits you, you can try to knock them over, which of course is very good. Um, and also, if you have the Absolute's brand, you take one less damage from all spells. One less damage from all spells is typically worse than plus one to saving throws. That's going to, on average, decrease damage that you take from spells more, I think, than reducing incoming damage by one. Um, this also lets you cast Fire Shield for the cold version of Fire Shield once per long rest, which is a reasonable upgrade, but by the time you get this in Act 2, you should have access to Scrolls of Fire Shield or Fire Shield as a spell, so it's less impactful than it would be if you got it earlier in the game. All of that together doesn't really make a compelling package to me. It's a fine item. Uh, if you have a particular use for Fire Shield, then you can make use of it. If you're a, a tanking character, of course, then uh, the Fire Shield will be reasonable. So this could be a decent option for a Retaliation build to get an extra cast of Fire Shield. I'm going to put it in B tier, but uh, in general, I think most parties will not have a character that that is super interested in this. It's mostly for a retaliation build, and they will often have other sources of fire shield. The Gloomstrand shield. The Gloomstrand shield uh, is just a normal shield, but it gives you stealth plus one. And like some of the armors that I talked about in my armor tier list, this stealth bonus actually increases your proficiency bonus to stealth. It doesn't just give you a plus one bonus to stealth. Normally that's identical, but for characters with stealth expertise, uh, this works out to a plus two bonus to your stealth because expertise doubles your proficiency bonus and this increases your proficiency bonus by one. So because of a quirk of how they coded this item, for characters that want it, uh, it will probably be a plus two bonus to stealth, because it's rare that you're going to take the stealth bonus shield on a character that doesn't have stealth expertise. This is a way to get a stealth bonus in a slot that normally doesn't allow you to do that. This is the only shield that increases your stealth. Um, and so you can benefit from this on a stealth archery character that's making a lot of stealth checks, uh, it's the only character that might want to make use of it. In general, you're going to want to have your melee slots for that character occupied by uh, weapons that increase your damage output, things like the Knife of the Undermountain King, etc., that, that increase your damage output. But if all you want to do is make the highest possible stealth checks, this is going to be a component of that build. So I guess technically it's C tier. Uh, for most characters, this won't be useful, but uh, for a specific character who's trying to make the highest possible stealth checks, this is one way to boost them that you don't, uh, you can't increase otherwise. The Iron Vine Shield. This is a weird one to show up in Act 2, because this would kind of be an interesting shield if it showed up in Act 1, uh, but unfortunately it shows up much later in the game and has sort of passed the point where it might be useful. The Iron Vine Shield, uh, gives you Whenever you are holding a weapon that's empowered by Shillelagh, so you have to be a character that has access to Shillelagh and have a staff or club and have cast Shillelagh on it, and then you get hit by a melee attack, you deal your wisdom uh, modifier in damage to the attacker. So you have to be a character that has Shillelagh, wants to cast it in fights, 
and wants to get hit. Um, that seems like a pretty unusual build to me, and uh, even like a druid or a nature cleric that wants to shillelagh in, in most fights is not going to want to be hit, and is going to be much better off with a shield that actually improves your uh, survivability in some way, or improves your damage output without you having to get attacked. I really want to like this shield because it's such a weird and unique effect, but unfortunately, I just don't think I can recommend it. It's even for the character that it's meant for, it doesn't do anything, so I'm going to put it in D tier. If you have a cool Iron Vine shield build, then do let me know in the comments, but um, for the most part, I just don't think this is a strategy worth pursuing. The Justice Year's Great Shield. So this gives you the normal plus two armor class, as well as the Shield Bash ability shared by the Adamantine Shield, and the Absolute's Protector, which of course is a very powerful ability in and of itself. It also gives you advantage on perception ability checks, uh, which is just a nice passive benefit for your party. This is good on any character with or without perception, because every character rolls perception checks, and so is going to make you a little bit better at finding traps and hidden things, which will just save you resources throughout a run. You won't have to heal up from traps or memorize their locations or spend resources avoiding them. In addition to that, it gives you the Darkness Cloak ability, which lets you, as a bonus action, cast a small area of darkness. It's smaller in radius than the Darkness spell, but identical in effect, and immediately attempt to hide in it as though you had just used the hide action. Um, basically, this gives you two full actions as a bonus action, cast darkness and activate hide, and gives bonus action hide to non-rogue characters, so you can enter hiding um, even in, as a bonus action, even if you're not rogue. Darkness is, of course, a ridiculously powerful effect. It makes you completely immune to ranged attacks, um, and you will always succeed on the hiding uh, when you're hiding in darkness, except when enemies have dark vision. Yes, even non-magical dark vision will still uh, you'll still have to roll hide checks against. You can see my bad tooltips video for uh, a more detailed explanation of that. Um, but against enemies without dark vision, you will always succeed on the hide checks, and uh, you still get a chance to roll against enemies with dark vision. That means that this is an amazing panic button. In a lot of fights, this just buys you a full turn of not getting hit. Um, it will always make you uh, immune to enemy ranged attacks for at least one round. It'll force enemy melee characters to come close to you in order to see you. Uh, while you may or may not be set up to actually take advantage of the darkness, you might not have Devil's Sight or some way to avoid uh, blind immunity. Of course, if you do have the Eversight Ring or any other way to avoid uh, being blinded by the darkness, then that's even more powerful. But even without that, darkness is just an incredibly powerful effect and an amazing panic button. The Justiciar's Great Shield gives you uh, an out when things start to go bad or just lets you save a low health character. Uh, it doesn't require concentration or anything like that, so it's great for concentrating on spells. You can you can cast a spell and then bonus action, enter darkness and hide, so that enemies can't turn off the spell that you're concentrating on. Um, it lasts for two turns, so it's going to keep you give you two turns of immunity to enemy ranged attacks. You can move out of the darkness, fire, move back into the darkness, etc., all just an incredibly powerful effect. Being able to cast darkness as a bonus action is wildly better than being able to cast darkness as an action, and being able to cast darkness as an action is already one of the best things that you can do in Baldur's Gate, so the Justiciar's Great Shield is going straight into S tier. It's an amazing effect that you can abuse in all kinds of uh, ways that make your character or your party incredibly difficult to uh, defeat. This also uh, is of special note for solo characters if because it will affect, um, while it normally won't hit your whole party, if you're playing solo, it's always going to hit all the characters on the field, which will just make the enemy AI go nuts because they'll have no idea where you are because you'll be hiding in the darkness effect. Uh, Justice here is Great Shield. Not every character can make use of it. You do This is a defensive item, and you do need to sort of, like, have a good sense of when to activate this, when it will be advantageous. And, of course, it's even better for warlocks and characters who are immune to the darkness. But the effect is so powerful that it's very much worth using. Ketherick's Shield. Uh, Ketherick's Shield gives you Shield Bash to AC and plus one to your spell save DCs and 
uh, spell attack rolls. Funnily enough, because the shield bash uses your spell save DCs, it boosts its own shield bash because it increases your spell save DC and then you can shield bash, so you're even better at knocking enemies over when you have this equipped. It also gives you advantage on dexterity saves, which is a small bonus, but nice to have. The big thing here is just the plus one to spell save DC. Obviously, that's incredible for any caster, and Ketherick's shield is going to be highly in demand for any caster that wants to cast spells on enemies. Plus two uh, save DC in a slot that normally can't get access to that effect without having to uh, take, like, dual wielder and wield multiple staves is obviously amazing. So Ketherick's shield is just an incredible item. The passive benefits of this shield are awesome, and it's going straight into S tier. This is probably my second most used shield in the entire game. The Sentinel Shield. I said Ketherick's shield was my second most used shield in the game, so you can probably guess what the most used shield is. The Sentinel Shield gives you a plus three bonus to your initiative, uh, an advantage on perception checks, as well as the shield bash passive. Plus three bonus to your initiative solves all of your initiative problems for a character. It almost replaces having to take alert or high dexterity on a character. And so we'll just patch holes in a build like no other item in the entire game can. It replaces having to take like a vigilance elixir or an entire feat means that you're going to go first and just gives you so much safety on honor mode. If you've watched any of my videos, you've heard me discuss at length how good initiative is, and this is one of the best bonuses to initiative in the game. Um, on a slot that a lot of characters that struggle with initiative want to use a good item for, the only downside of the Sentinel Shield is that there's only one, uh, because you would give it to your entire party if you could, S tier. The Shield of Devotion. So this gives you, again, the normal two armor class and one additional level one spell slot. The additional uh, level one spell slot, you can do some weird abusive things by swapping this item in and out because of how the game calculates it. There are some ways to get infinite spell slots uh, by uh, abusing bugs with equipping and unequipping this shield and changing the number of spell slots that your characters have and stuff. Um, I'm going to be ignoring those for the purpose of... of uh, evaluating this shield. The plus one spell slot is a level one spell slot is a nice bonus. It's definitely something that you can use. And for uh, the characters that it's sort of intended for, like paladins or um, clerics, spell slots are in high demand. It's especially good for paladins who have few spell slots and want to smite with them. So a level one spell slot is more valuable for them than for other characters. It also lets you cast aid once per long rest as a level three spell. So worth 10 hit points, but it only casts on the caster, so basically it improves your maximum HP by 10 when you have it, provided that you're not casting aid with another party member. There's a decent chance that you are casting aid with another party member or a camp caster if you use camp casters, um, so the Shield of Devotion will often overlap with something that you're already doing. But plus 10 maximum hit points isn't totally irrelevant. In general, one extra level 1 spell slot and plus 10 maximum hit points um, and the shield bash is just not enough to make me want to use this over one of the more powerful shields. For something like a paladin, I would prefer to have high initiative with the sentinel shield or better defenses with the adamantine shield. Um, for something like a cleric, I would prefer the plus save DC on Ketherick's shield in general. So I don't think there's that many characters that are really interested in the shield of devotion. Um, in general, I think this is just a relatively uh, weak package of abilities, but if you don't have aid elsewhere in your party, it does let you get that, and it does have some abusive use cases, and shield bash is never bad. I'm going to put it in B tier because I think it's it's fine to equip this item. It's certainly not going to hurt you. Um, but in general, you're just going to be better off with one of the higher tier shields. The Shield of Scorching Reprisal. Shield of Scorching Reprisal is a 2 AC shield with Shield Bash, which of course is a very good ability, and gives you Fire Resistance, which is a very relevant damage type to gain resistance to. Fire damage is the most common type of elemental damage, so resistance to it is very useful for a lot of encounters, and just randomly enemies will do a lot of fire damage, so this decreases incoming damage significantly. It also allows you, once per short rest, to activate it as a bonus action to gain one additional AC, making it effectively a three AC shield. Um, and when enemies miss you with an attack, they take a d6 of fire damage with a dexterity save for half. 
that deck save, just like the shield bash, is also based on your spell save DC. All the shield effects use your spell save DC. Um, so you can actually do an okay amount of retaliation damage because enemies missing you, they'll miss you like multiple times with melee attacks if they're attacking multiple times. And the additional damage can add up if you're a high AC character. If you wanted a plus three AC shield, like the, the plus one shield, the shield of scorching reprisal is just better because, uh, once per short rest, so in most encounters in a day, you'll be able to have it as a 3 AC shield that gives you fire resistance and shield bash. So it's just going to be basically strictly better than the plus one shield. The retaliation damage you can pretty safely ignore, but for the most part, this is just an improved version of the plus one shield. So any character who's looking to get high armor class can just use the shield of scorching reprisal instead and have resistance to fire and shield bash in addition to plus three AC. Even for the short rests, if you're doing a long adventuring day, um, even for the short rests where you don't have the activated ability, it's still a 2 AC shield with fire resistance and shield bash, which is a totally respectable thing to be, so the shield of scorching reprisal is pretty nice. It's a purely defensive option, so obviously I'm going to prefer the more aggressive options in S tier, but this is still a, a very solid item, and for any character that wants to just get high AC is going to be great, A tier. The Watcher's Shield. The Watcher's Shield gives you advantage on perception checks and no other effects. It's available in Act 2, uh, and obviously by Act 2 you have access to way better options than this. Notably, this ability is duplicated on the Justiciar's Great Shield and the Sentinel Shield, two of the best shields in the game. So even if you want this particular ability, you have access to really powerful items that give it to you in, an, in addition to uh, their actual effects. D tier, it doesn't really do anything. Abdel's Trusted Shield. So this is the first of our Act 3 shields, and is a reference to the previous Baldur's Gate games. Um, it gives you 2 AC and the Shield Bash ability, as well as the ability to cast Protection from Missiles once per short rest. Protection from Missiles is a normal spell in uh, Dungeons & Dragons that's only implemented on items in Baldur's Gate 3. I'm not sure why they decided not to implement it also as a spell. Uh, normally it's a level 3 spell, but for some reason when you cast it from these items it casts as a level 2 spell. I'm also not certain why they decided to do that. All of that's just trivia though. The effect of the spell is that it is an action to cast, uh, so you need to pre-cast it before combat if you want to really make use of it. Requires your concentration and gives enemy ranged weapon attacks, specifically weapon attacks, a disadvantage against you, and they do half damage. That's a pretty powerful effect against a lot of ranged enemies, but requiring your action and your concentration is a pretty hefty price for a purely defensive effect. And if you want protection from missiles, well, you know what protects you perfectly from missiles in Baldur's Gate 3? Darkness. So the Justiciar's Great Shield just eats this shield's roll entirely, because it's a bonus action, it gives you 100% protection instead of only 50%, or um, a little better than 50%, because it's disadvantage and having the damage. Uh, so you would only ever want Abdel's Trusted Shield if you needed to protect multiple characters from ranged weapons in the same encounter. Maybe there's an encounter with a lot of them. For that encounter, though, you can just use a Scroll of Darkness or an Arrow of Darkness, or just cluster your characters closely together for the Justiciar's Great Shield. There just isn't a, a situation where the protection for missiles is going to be better than uh, spending your action on something good, concentrating on something good. Um, it's a purely defensive option. It's a relatively low-level spell available only in Act 3. Uh, so I just don't recommend Abdel's Trusted Shield. We're putting it into D tier. The Shield of Shielding. Love the name. Uh, not a huge fan of the item, I have to say. The Shield of Shielding gives you two armor class and the Shield Bash ability, as well as the ability to cast sh the Shield spell once per long rest. A level 1 spell once per long rest is not that exciting when you get to Act 3, even if it's one that your class normally doesn't have access to. Now, there's no bigger fan of the shield spell than me. I love that spell. I think that it is extremely powerful. But when it's only once per long rest, it uses a lot, loses a lot of its appeal. Um, if it was once per short rest, it would maybe be much more interesting, especially because you're giving up the passive benefits of... Uh, the other shields in order to make use of that. Blocking one hit is probably not as good throughout an adventuring day as um, the adamantine shield just passively preventing critical hits all day, or increasing your armor class by one 
uh, all the time rather than by five once from the plus one shield or the shield of scorching reprisal. You also aren't getting any offensive benefits. So the shield of shielding is just not very useful for most characters. There is one use, which is to equip it until you get attacked and then swap to a different shield. Um, so if that's something that you don't mind microing, then you can use the shield of shielding for that. Uh, for that reason, I'm going to put it in C tier. Uh, but in general, you can safely ignore this one. Swire's sled board. I have to say, all the alliteration that they use in these shields makes my job as a person who has to say these words very quickly over and over again very difficult. Swire's sled board uh, gives you the normal plus two AC from a shield and the shield bash ability, just like all of the other high tier shields. Um, and in addition to that, at the beginning of your turn in combat, you gain two turns of force conduit. Force conduit reduces all incoming bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage by one per turn remaining. Um, so it's basically a stack of damage reduction per turn, and you get two stacks of it at the beginning of each of your turns. And if you have five or more turns remaining, when you get hit, you deal AoE damage around you, 1d4 force damage. This is really powerful for builds that are building up a lot of damage reduction. It means that when fights go long, you're going to build up a ton of damage reduction and then start doing retaliation damage. And this can basically be a, a support for, let's say, your Abjuration uh, Ward stacks. Your Arcane Ward is going to tick down throughout the course of a combat as enemies hit it and it gets reduced. Well, the Swire's Sled Board is going to tick up throughout the combat because the it just gains two every turn. So you're increasing by one every turn. Uh, you know, it, it gains two and then loses one duration each turn. So you gain effectively plus one duration on it each turn. So this can offset the normal attrition of your Arcane Ward if you're an Abjuration Wizard uh, throughout combat. It's also, of course, good with other Force Conduit items, so you can stack up Force Conduit really quickly and get a ton of damage reduction, good with other sources of damage reduction, so just a solid build, a solid item for any character that's using damage reduction. The downside is that it does need fights to go long, but those builds, like retaliation builds and stuff, will tend to encourage longer fights anyways, so Swire's Sled Board, while uh, not an amazing offensive option, is a very powerful defensive option for certain builds, and those builds are strong enough that I'm going to put it in A tier. The Shield of the Undevout. The Shield of the Undevout is sort of the mirror of the Shield of Devotion. Um, it gives you an additional level 1 spell slot, which, similar to that, you can use to smite if you're a paladin, or to cast a lower level spell, like a bless or a shield spell, something along those lines, and the Shield Bash ability. In addition to that, it gives you, uh, your enemies have disadvantage on saving throws against your fear effects. And this is all, uh, effects that are sort of fear-ish. Fear and frightened are different conditions in Baldur's Gate, um, but both of them will have disadvantage on the saves against those effects. This is particularly good for characters that are casting fear, of course, the fear spell, but especially good for great old one warlocks who are probably unleashing a lot of fears every turn and can cause enemies to um, ha have to make those saving throws with disadvantage. Those characters also will tend to have high save DCs, so you're going to be better at using the shield bash ability than a lot of other characters. So the shield of the undevout can be very good for fear-causing builds. The main downside of this item is that you get it uh, late-ish in Act 3. Obviously, it depends on the order that you play through, but you have to do a bunch of content in Act 3 before you get this item. And almost all of the enemies in Act 3 are immune to fear. There are a few that aren't, but they're, they tend to be sort of lower-level chaff enemies, uh, and a lot of the most important fights in Act 3, the enemies will be immune to fear. So by the time you get this item, it is going to come up much less often than if you got it earlier in the game. The Shield of the Undevout, therefore, I'm going to put in B tier, because it is very powerful for uh, the fights where it's good, where enemies can actually be affected by fear. Disadvantage on saving throws against a debilitating uh, condition is definitely a powerful effect, but enough enemies are immune to fear in the late game that, unfortunately, the Shield of the Undevout is going to fall off a little bit, and so you will not be able to use it as much. Still best in slot for a Great Old One Warlock, probably, just because of the constant passive fears that you're outputting. Uh, 
you can be more active with this item and swap it in and out depending on whether the enemies you're facing are immune to fear or not. E even if you're lazy like me and don't feel like doing that, it will still be a very solid choice for a character that's causing a lot of fear effects. Um, but in general, this item is held back a little bit by the late game, the prevalence of immunity to fear in the late game. And finally, the last of our Act 3 shields, Viconia's Walking Fortress. The only legendary shield in the game, this one gives you plus three to your armor class, so same as the plus one shield, or when activated, the shield of Scorching Reprisal, uh, gives you an improved version of Shield Bash, where you not only get to knock an enemy um, prone, you also get to deal 2d4 force damage to them, which is a nice little bonus on top of the already very powerful Shield Bash ability. You also get advantage on saving throws against spells, uh, and any spell attack roll made against you has disadvantage. So you're, you're very, very hard to hit with spells when you're using Viconia's Walking Fortress. In addition to that, once per short rest, you can activate Reflective Shell as a bonus action, which for two turns makes projectiles targeted at you go back to the caster instead. The physics on this item are a little bit wonky, so it will work oddly sometimes, but for the most part, if an enemy targets this, uh, the user of this item, they will take the hit instead. They'll roll an attack roll against themselves. Magic missiles will get turned back against the caster. Thrown items will get turned back against the, the caster, so they'll, like, grenade themselves and stuff. Also, the AI doesn't play around this effect at all, basically, so they will constantly bombard themselves with grenades, um, and, uh, et, et, et cetera. Um, one thing that is a little weird is that attack rolls, enemies will attack you, and then they'll have to make the attack roll against themselves. Uh, and that attack roll will always be made with disadvantage. Um, I'm not entirely sure what causes this effect. It's not listed in the tooltip, but that does seem to always happen. Uh, so the reflective shell obviously gives you complete immunity to ranged weapons, similar to the Justicier's Great Shield, but even better than that, because it also blocks a lot of AoE effects that use projectiles and just completely uh, punks the AI because... It doesn't understand not to shoot at you and takes massive amounts of damage as a result. Oh, also, you can cast Warding Bond once per long rest when you're using this shield. Uh, obviously, that's not the important part. This shield is the legendary shield in the game, and it lives up to that. It gives you plus three AC, an incredibly powerful bonus action, uh, one of the best bonus action defensive abilities in the game. Um, weirdly, there are some some interesting things about this item where like you want enemies to target you when you have this up so it can be worth it to deliberately tank your ac on the character that has this equipped so that ranged enemies target them and then hurt themselves um or you can just use it as an incredible defensive piece of equipment that makes you very hard to hurt with spells basically immune to ranged weapons and because it gives you plus three ac and shield dash basically immune to melee weapons one of the best tank items in the game the only real question is, is it, uh, is there, are there cases where you would prefer the adamantine shield over it? And there probably are because critical hit immunity is so good, but critical hit immunity you can get elsewhere and you can't get the incredible effects of the walking fortress elsewhere. So, uh, any character that can equip this is going to benefit massively from it. And obviously it's going straight into S tier where it belongs. I mean, that's where you want the legendary items. Um, and have fun with this item. There are so many cool things you can do with it to just like ruin the AI's day completely. All right, my friends, I hope that you enjoyed this look at every shield in Baldur's Gate 3. Um, just to quickly sum up, after Act 1, your party setup will typically be the adamantine shield and some combination of these three shields. If you had four characters with shield proficiency, you'd probably have equipped all of those. By the end of Act 2, you'll have swapped to these four shields. And by the end of Act 3, you'll have worked in Viconia's Walking Fortress, probably over the adamantine shield uh, because you have other sources of critical hit immunity, but you can also swap in the Justicier's shield instead. Ketherick's shield and the Sentinel shield are going to stay with you all game. They're just so good. Uh, if you have a character that can use the spell Save DC from Ketherick's shield, and every party should make use of the Sentinel shield.
As always, I hope that you enjoyed this tier list. And if you think there's something that I missed or should move around, please do let me know in the comments. I'm always very uh, open to moving things around based on community feedback. Um, if you have a good argument as to why I should move it, then I will definitely take that into consideration. And we've moved many things in the past. If you did enjoy the video, of course, feel free to hit the like button. That does help me out a lot. And leave a comment, which helps out with the algorithm. YouTube cares a lot about those engagement metrics. So as much as it pains me to have to harass you every time, uh, it does help out a lot. So I really do appreciate you taking the time to do that. And of course, you can subscribe to my channel for more Baldur's Gate 3 guides and other strategy game analysis. Cheers, my friends. I'll catch you next time.